Amen. Amen. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his courts with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name for the Lord is good and his mercy is everlasting and his truth endureth to all generations. Let us pray. Father, we come before you today, this wonderful Sabbath day, for it is wonderful because you have allowed us to rise from our slumber and to make our way to this place of worship. Father, we thank you for being here with us, dwelling with us, striving with us, helping us from week to week. Father, now as we worship you this morning, we pray your blessing on all that is done here. And we pray that when we leave this place, we will be closer to you and have a better knowledge and saving knowledge of Jesus Christ who died for us. We pray this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, everyone, and happy Sabbath. To kick off our Black History Month celebration, um, we're going to be using Lift Every Voice and Sing as kind of our hymn of the month. Now, uh, this cherished um, hymn, this uh, black history anthem, started out as a poem by James Weldon Johnson. And th there are, um, there's a lot of words. Now, hopefully, they'll be on the screen. But here's what I want you to do. I know all of you are tech savvy in here. Pull out your telephone. Go to the Google and type in lift every voice and sing, or if you like my phone, I have a little microphone. Okay, they're up there on the, so uh, just go to it and so you can kind of look at the words as we sing. This only works if we kind of all sing the words together. Um, so let me just read you one of my favorite, there, there are like three stanzas here to this poem. Let me read you my favorite stanza. It says, Stony the road we trod, bitter the chastening rod, felt in the days when hope unborn had died. Yet, with a steady beat, have not our weary feet come to the place for which our fathers sighed. We have come over a way that with tears have been watered. We have come treading the path through the blood of the slaughtered. Out from the gloomy past, till now we stand at last, where the white gleam of our bright star is cast. Isn't that a beautiful? Okay, so let's all join in together as we sing our Black National Anthem. Lift every voice and sing Till earth and heaven ring Ring with the harmonies of liberty Let our rejoicing rise high as the lifting skies Let it resound Loud as the rolling sea. Sing a song. Sing a song 
full of the faith that the darkness has taught us. Bring us home, full of the hope that the present has brought us. Facing the rising sun of our new day, begun. Let us march on till victory is won. Stony the road we trod, bitter the chasing rod, felt in the days when hope unborn had died, yet with a steady Feet have not a weary feet. Come to the place for which our Father sighed. We have come, we have come over our way that tears have been watered. We have come treading our path through. The blood of the Lord Out from the gloomy past Till now we stand at last Where the white gleam of our bright star is cast All together God of our weary years, God of our silent tears, Thou who hast brought us thus far on the way, Thou who hast by thy might led us into the light keep us forever in the path we pray let's not feet let's not be stray from the places on God where we met thee let's not heart drunk Wide of the worldly dead, shadow beneath the hand. May we forever stand true to our God, true to our. Very good. You may be seated. Have we had a good week this week? Has God been there when you needed him? Amen. Amen. It's prayer time. We just want to continue to lift up those special prayers that have been stated over the past few weeks to also remind us that there is a God in heaven who looks upon us and all of our deficiencies and needs and wants and desires but there's one thing he wants of us 
and that is to live with him throughout the ceaseless ages of eternity. Attending a few funerals these past few weeks and visiting hospitals and you just wonder sometimes if you're like me when is this all going to end? When is it all going to be over with? When are we going to actually see Jesus coming through the clouds to take us home? We're not the first generation to wonder that. But I know that it will be soon. And I know that we must be ready. I know that we must not be saddened by all the things that come at us every day. But yet we must pray that God will guide us continually toward his light. That God will keep us in the way that he will bless us that he will be with our young people that he will be with all of those who love him so as we pray this morning I'd like for each one of us to pray silently first for our own conditions for our own needs and those things that we desire of God. I was reading also this week that it said where two people agree, God will be with them and answer their prayers as it is in line with the will of God. Can we do that this morning? If any of you have a special prayer that you would like to uh, pray about this morning and that you want God to hear this morning, I'll ask that you just come down and pray with us. Church, we are also praying for Randy King. We want a good outcome for his situation coming up this week. Let's pray for Randy. Let's pray for all of those who are infirm, the sick and the shut in. And let's pray that God will give us what we need to be saved in his kingdom. Let us come now. Father and our God, we come humbly yet boldly before your throne of grace. Lord, we've had so many trials in our lives, we've had so many challenges. 
But Father, we pray that you would help us to continue to look upon you. That you would guide us through and keep us faithful to you. Lord, we pray that you will help us use our gifts and our talents that you've given us, each one of us, to spread your message, to be good stewards of your word and your gospel, to be responsible for helping others and witnessing to others. So, Father, we pray that you would Allow us to be that light and that witness. Father, we pray for this church and our church family. We pray that this may be the place where people can find refuge and come. We pray that you will bless those who come through these doors seeking you. Father, we pray for our sick and our shut in. We pray for those who are hurting and suffering, grieving, lonely, downcast and confused. Father, we pray on their behalf. Lord God, we pray that you would allow your spirit to be with us. Father, we pray that you would deliver us from evil and the influences of evil, and those who would be purveyors of evil. Father, we pray your protection. Father, we pray for this church and the leadership of this church. We pray for the local leadership as well as our corporate leadership, that we may be found walking in the path that you would have us to go and doing and saying and being what you would have us to do and say and be. Now, Father, we pray for those special requests today. Lord, we don't know what you have planned, but we know that you wish above all things that we may prosper and be in health. So we pray that prayer today. Lord, forgive us of all of the sins we commit and we constantly commit. Forgive us, help us, guide us, keep us. We pray for the speaker of the hour that you would be with him and anoint him that we may learn and grow in your grace. Now, Father, bless us throughout this worship. Bless every aspect of this worship. May what we do be pleasing in your sight. For we ask this prayer in the name of Jesus Christ, who died for each one of us. Let us all say, Amen.
Amen. Wasn't that beautiful? Who's marching in the light of God this morning? I'm marching in the light of God. Isn't it good to be in God's house today? Brother Bertram shared his favorite verse to the Black National Anthem, and I want to share mine. My favorite one is the one that says, God of our weary years, God of our silent tears, Thou who has brought us thus far on our way. Thou who has by thy might led us into the light. Keep us forever in the path we pray. We praise God today. This is the God that we've come to worship. Not only the God of our salvation, but the God who through his son has brought salvation to the entire world. He's a good God, a faithful God a God of deliverance, a God of healing, a God of might and salvation. We give him glory today. I want to welcome you into the house of worship today. Are you glad to be in the house of worship? I'm so glad to be here today. I want to extend a special welcome to those of you who are visiting with us. I want to um, say welcome to those who have come from the Freedom House today who are visiting today. We're so glad to have you and that you've chosen to come and worship with us here at City Temple. It's such a blessing to have you here, and we want you to know that you're always welcome, and we hope that you'll continue to come and to worship with us. At this point in our service, we love to take this opportunity not only to greet our visitors, but also to greet each other 
And so we want to take a moment as the music plays just to greet each other with smiles and hugs and kisses in the name of the Lord. Let's do that at this time. I am a friend of God. I am a friend of God. I am a friend of God. He calls me friend. I am a friend of God. I am a friend of God. I am a friend of God. He calls me friend. Who am I that you are mindful of me, that you hear me when I call? Is it true that you are thinking of me, how you love me? It's amazing, I'm a friend of God. I'm a friend of God. I'm a friend of God. He calls me friend. I'm a friend of God. I'm a friend of God. I'm a friend of God. He calls me friend. God Almighty. God As we return to our seats, I would like to just share a few announcements with us before we continue with our worship service today. We um, want to remember that at 4.30, we have a regularly scheduled Vespers program. And um, also today at 4.00, the um, Bridge Project, the joint venture between the Michigan Conference and Young People in the Lake Region Conference is going to be taking place at the Oakwood Church at 4, and so all young adults are welcome to attend that. And then we want to remember that tomorrow is our joint men's ministry and women's ministry prayer brunch. Amen, somebody. And so we want to invite everybody to come out. I'm looking forward to being there tomorrow as we share this time of food and fellowship, time in the word, and time in prayer. So please plan to come out tomorrow at 11 as we join in that service together. Of course, we want to remember that prayer meeting is going to be this Wednesday at noon and also at 7 o'clock. We've just been having such a blessed time in our prayer meeting service. I want to invite you to come out and join and be a part with us. Please plan to come out for prayer meeting this coming week, um, either at noon or at 7. Um, I'm sad to announce today that one of our brothers from the Freedom House, Brother Cabeto, lost his mother unexpectedly this week. 
um, and he's unable to travel to go um, to his mother's funeral. So we want to lift up our brother Cabeto in prayer. Um, we want you to know that our love and our support is with you, brother, during this time of, of grief. We not only want to pray for him, but it seems as if we've had just a string of losses over the past few weeks. And um, we know that um, as we go through the grieving process, that's not something that ends after the announcements about it ends. It keeps on going for quite a while. And so our prayers and our hearts go out to all of those in our church family who are in the midst of loss and grief. We keep our eyes fixed on Jesus because our hope is in him. He promises that one day he's going to come and rob the grave. I can't wait till that day. I can't wait until the day when death is destroyed, when sin is no more and Satan himself will be destroyed forevermore. I can't wait till that day. How about you? Amen. Until then, we worship, we rejoice and hope today as we worship our Lord and our God in spirit and in truth. May he bless us. Good morning. How many of us are thankful for what God has done for us this week? Amen. We're still here. We still have heat. Most of us may not be as hot as we want it to be. And we are in church today. God has brought us here for a reason. God has provided for us. And our way of responding to him is to return unto him a faithful tithe and offering. So will our officers please stand? As Baal has. Father, again, we give you thanks for what you've given us. Help us to be faithful in all aspects of life. So as we return unto you, a part of what you've given us, we just ask that you would bless these offerings and may they be used to the furtherance of your work. For Christ's sake, amen. join with us as we sing. Just want to praise you. Just want to praise you forever and ever and ever for all you've done for me. Blessings and glory and honor, they all belong to you. Thank you, Jesus, for blessing me. Just want to praise you forever and ever and ever. Blessings and glory and honor, they all belong to you. Thank you, Jesus, for blessing me. Just want to praise you forever and ever and ever. Blessings and glory and honor, they all belong to you. Blessings and glory and honor, they all belong to you. Blessings and glory and honor, they all belong to you. 
Yes, ye have robbed me. But ye say, wherein have ye robbed the in tithes and in offerings? Will the congregation please stand? Praise God from whom all standing for scripture. Our scripture today is coming from 1 John 1, 1 through 4. We proclaim to you the one who existed from the beginning, whom we've heard and seen. We saw him with our own eyes and touched him with our hands. He is with the, he is the word of life. This is, this is, sorry, this one who is life itself was revealed to us, and we have seen him. And now we testify and proclaim to you that he is the one who is eternal. He was with the Father, and then he was revealed to us. We proclaim to you what we ourselves have actually seen and heard, so that you may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We are writing these things so that you may fully share our joy. May the Lord add a rich blessing to the reading, hearing, and doing, and understanding of his word. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Thank you. 
Listen, listen, listen. I don't feel no waste time. No, no, no. I come too far from where I started from. Nobody told me that the road would be I don't believe he brought me this far just to leave me. Listen, I've been running for Jesus a mighty long time. You can look at me and tell that. I've been sometimes up and show been sometimes down. But I'm so glad that Jesus lifted me. I'm so glad that he's a God of love. He said if I confess my sins, he's faithful and just to forgive me. I tell you, I don't feel no way tired now. I, I just don't feel no way tired. No, 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 no. I've come too far from where I started. I started from. Listen, listen. Nobody told me that this old road would be easy. Don't believe he brought me this far just to leave me. I don't feel no waste time. No, 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 no. Come on, man. I come too far from where, from where, I, started. where I started from. Nobody told me the road would be easy. And I don't. No. Believe he brought me this far Say, just to leave me. Say, I don't believe. I don't believe that he brought me this far. I don't believe that all the things that I've had to go through is in hell. Do you believe? Yeah, I believe he carried you. I believe it's God that oh, God is confident in me. I don't believe me on, all don't through, believe. through sickness, oh, through pain, me through heartache and shame. I oh, just yes, believe God to oh, yes, save me he from the uttermost oh, oh, to yes, the uttermost. I don't, I don't. Do you believe he brought me this far? Do you believe he brought you this far? Do you believe he brought you this far? Do you believe he brought you this far? Do you believe that God has brought you this far? If you believe that God has brought you and that he's going to keep you, I want you to stand with the choir and say, I don't. Oh, yes, I do. I don't believe it. He's a good God. He's an amazing God. He's an all time God. He's a good God. Say amen. Yes, he is. 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 Thank you. 
Let us pray. Oh, Father, we ask today that you would open our eyes, allow us to see your Son. May Jesus come to be more to us than anything. In fact, may he become our everything. Lord, today we pray that you would visit us and that as we open your word, that you would cause us to receive a revelation of your will for us. More than that, a revelation of yourself and that we would gain life and liberty and transformation from it. In Jesus' name, let all God's children say, Amen. Tonight, to this morning, rather, I'd like to um, direct our attention to the screen where our message is going to be a little bit um, different than it has been over the last few weeks as I'm going to be presenting um, based on what we want to share with you from the screen. But before we do so, I just want to open today by sharing a story that I read about a young woman named Linda. She was traveling from Alberta, Canada to the Yukon, and she was going over very rough, rugged mountain terrain. But she was driving a little beat up old Honda Civic. She didn't know that you don't make a trip from Alberta to the Yukon to this little place that she was going to called White House, White Horse, rather, in a little Civic. As a matter of fact, this is four-wheel drive only country. But there she was, trugging along up through the mountain passes until the end of day one of her journey, she got to a summit and she saw a little inn there and she went over to stay in the inn. And she noticed that the woman behind the desk looked a little puzzled when she said she wanted a 5 a.m. Wake up call. But it all made sense when she woke up at five the next morning. She got the call and looked outside and saw that the entire mountain was shrouded with dense, thick fog. And really, she couldn't go anywhere. But she didn't want to look stupid, so she got up and she went down to breakfast anyhow. And when she got down to breakfast in the little place, there were two burly truckers sitting in the dining area. And they said, oh, come over and eat with us. She didn't want to, but she felt obliged because it was such a small place. So she went over and they were talking to her. They asked her, where are you going? She, she said, I'm going to Whitehorse. She, they said, what? In that little Civic? They said, oh, no, you're not. And they said, in this fog, they said, you'd never make the trip. They said, well, we're going to have to hug you. She pushed back. She said, you're not going to touch me. They said, no, 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 not like that. What we're going to do is we're going to put one truck in front of you. And we're going to put one truck behind you so that you just drive between us. And so for the rest of that morning, going through the dense fog, she had the security of driving behind two red brake lights in the front and knowing that behind her was an escort backing her up in the rear. Beloved, you and I are going on a treacherous journey. And we will never make it by ourselves through the dense fog. We need to be hugged. We need the fellowship of Christian brothers and sisters to go before us and also to come behind us and encourage us along the way. Today, I want to talk about the importance of fellowship in the church of God. We're using as a title, Focus on Fellowship. Now, I want to say that I know that every time we hear the word fellowship, it sounds to us like something that would be good, something that's ideal, something that's warm and fuzzy, something that if you could have that also with your Christian life, it would be nice. But I want to tell us today, I want us to see from God's word today that this idea of fellowship and the true and the full meaning of fellowship is not something to the side. It's not something that would be nice. It's not a good ideal to seek after. But fellowship is actually at the core of what it means to be Christian. And at the core of what it means to be a Christian church. 
Without fellowship, there is no Christian. And without fellowship, there is no Christian church. You may have what amounts to be a club or a group or a gathering, but it's not Christian unless there's fellowship. Today, we want to focus on fellowship. I want to use as our scripture today, coming from 1 John 1, verses 1 through 4. It's a little cut off at the top. I want to use our main passage coming from 1 John. And it says, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled, of the word of life, For the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness, and show unto you that eternal life, which was with the Father, and was manifested unto us. That which we have seen and heard, declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things write we unto you, that what, everybody? That your joy, your what? Your jo- Anybody have any joy in the house tonight? That your joy may be full. Focus on fellowship. As the Apostle John is writing to the next generation of believers toward the end of the first century, he focuses on this idea of fellowship. He centers everything that he says to them, and he addresses every challenge that they're facing with this idea of the fellowship that they have with God. His thematic statement in the book of 1 John is in verse 5 that says, God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. And if we have fellowship with God, John wants to say, then everything else that flows out of us and that we manifest should bear witness whether we are in fellowship or out of fellowship. John focuses on fellowship. I want us to notice the words that he uses. Notice that as he says, that which is from the beginning. First of all, what is from the beginning? He's actually talking about God, but particularly God the Son, Jesus Christ. Really, John here is echoing, in other words, the same thing that he says in the Gospel of John, starting with verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, all things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that has been made. In other words, the word, Jesus Christ, God manifests in the flesh, was in the beginning with God, and he's come to us. And John wants to declare that we have heard him. We have seen him. We have looked upon him. We have handled him. Our eyes were involved. Our hands were involved. The life that was from the beginning was manifested unto us. John begins by saying we had a real encounter with the living God. We experienced Jesus personally. We didn't just hear about Jesus. We didn't just learn about Jesus, but we experienced Jesus And in that experience, we encountered life, eternal life. We heard it. We saw it. We looked at it. We handled it. You see his words, his descriptive, experiential, sensory words? Then he says, that which we have seen and heard, we do what? We declare. In other words, The gospel proclamation, hear me now, evangelism, true evangelism, comes out of a real encounter 
with the living God, God's son, Jesus Christ. He's saying what we experience of Jesus, that's what we proclaimed. That's what we declared to you. Why? That you also may have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. In other words, evangelism flows out of fellowship. <laughs> In other words, genuine gospel work flows out of genuine living fellowship with the Father and with the Son and with each other. Moreover, genuine gospel work has as its goal fellowship. Amen. Did you get that? In other words, we had fellowship we told you about it so that in the end you could come and join the fellowship that we have with the Father and the Son. By now, I hope, I hope that your mind is connecting the dots between what I'm saying right now and what I've been saying for the last two weeks. Two weeks ago, we shared in the invitation part one, intimacy with Jesus, that the goal of the Christian life is what, everybody? Relationship, intimacy, right? Intimacy with God the Father and God the Son. Last week we learned that when we are able to experience this intimacy, then we're able to have rest. Today I want to share with us that this type of intimate relationship is what church life is all about. So we can stop for a moment and think about the things that you think church life is about. Think about some of them. What, what comes to mind? Right. Whatever that is, put that down here on the list and then put up front in big caps with highlighter on it. Fellowship is what the Christian life is about. Remember that Jesus experiences deep, intimate fellowship with the father. He says no one knows the son, but the father. And no one knows the Father but the Son, and whoever the Son chooses to reveal him to. Then he says, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. In other words, I will bring you into this eternal, intimate, exclusive relationship of love and submission that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit has enjoyed for all eternity. That's what Jesus comes to give. And then he leaves the church to extend to the world that they would come from the world and come into this inner circle of light and intimacy and love and submission and life. This is the goal of the church. Fellowship. The Greek word is koinonia. This um, presentation is acting up a little bit because I had to change the format. So there's some things that are coming out a little bit funny, but we'll look over that. But koinonia, I don't throw Greek words around in the pulpit. So this is an important one, right? Koinonia, say it with me, koinonia. Koinonia, it means an association involving close mutual relations and involvement, close association or fellowship. It describes the experience of being close and sharing something in common. But it also describes, excuse me, the attitude of the people who are holding things in common. They have an attitude of intimacy and mutual interest directed towards one another. But it also includes, it also describes the tangible things that we do and we give because of that fellowship. So in other words, the gifts 
and the sharing and the self-sacrifice and the time spent, right? Look at you, brother. I see you struggling. You don't have any shoes. Let me go buy you some shoes. Oh, sister, I noticed that you can't pay for your child's tuition. You know what? I have a little saved up. I was going to go and use it for this vacation, but you know what? Forget the vacation. I'm sending your child to school. <laughs> oh, it got quiet right there. <laughs> fellowship, fellowship is the relationship. It's the attitude, or koinonia is the relationship. It's the attitude, and it's actually the tangible things that we do because we are in fellowship. What Christians share in common is life in Jesus Christ, the Son of God. We share a common experience with Jesus. And here's the problem. If we did not really have a living encounter with Jesus, or if that's not what we have emphasized, then that does not become characteristic of who we are. Let me explain what I mean by that. If our emphasis or the track or the journey that we took was more knowledge oriented, this is what you need to know. Oh, it's quiet out there. If it's more behaviorally oriented, this is what you need to do. Then what happens is that this type of fellowship does not become cherished by us, characteristic of us, or exhibited by us. The Apostle Paul says that, in fact, knowledge puffs up. The more we know, when knowledge is our emphasis, becomes the more proud we are, and the more discord and distance there is between us. But when our emphasis is a living encounter with Jesus by his word and by his spirit, then we are able not only to have genuine love for Jesus and the Father, but genuine love for each other. And that becomes characteristic of who we are. Koinonia, fellowship. The most classic example of what we're describing comes to us from the book of Acts. Acts chapter 2, beginning with verse 42, and it says, And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers, and fear came upon every soul. And many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. So notice, and they continued steadfastly all the way with endurance in the apostles' doctrine. That was their teaching about Jesus. And in what? That's koinonia. And in, now describing it, breaking of bread and in prayers. And fear came upon every soul. In other words, everyone was struck by a common sense of the awe of God. People were not stuck on their opinions and their preferences and what they wanted and how they wanted to see things go. But everyone had a humility about themselves because they were struck by an awe of God. Fear came upon them. People were silent because they wanted to know, how is God leading us? It also manifested itself by eating together, by praying together, by studying the word of God together and it says and many were pictures on the screen <laughs> thank you many were wonders rather and signs were done among the apostles and all that believed were together and had all things how everybody in common it doesn't mean that they put everything in one pot but even what they own they didn't consider it primarily as being theirs it was what I have is for the, the, the sake of us. Oh, Lord, have mercy. And sold their possessions and goods 
and parted them to all men as every man had need. Now, wait a minute. When's the last time you sold something so that somebody that's in need could have something? You know, I don't have that right now, but you know what? Let me go sell this flat screen TV. I don't need it anyhow. And I'm going to take the money. I'm going to give it to you so you can take care of this need. When's the last time we did that? And they continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house. So they're not only worshiping together communally at the temple, but they're also going to each other's houses. Lord have mercy. <laughs> Did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. This is the, the epitome of fellowship. This is the, the, the most famous description of what koinonia looks like in the New Testament. It says they were praising God and having favor with all the people. And look, and the Lord did what? The Lord what? The Lord what? They went out and had a whole bunch of evangelistic meetings. But wait a minute, what about the Great Commission? As they were being the church, the Lord grew them as a church. I'm going to say that again. As they were being the church. Being the church means being joined in fellowship with the Father and the Son and each other. Everything else flowed out of that. God sent people to them and the Spirit sent them to people because they were being the church. What would you say if I told you that every problem that we face as a church congregation would be solved? Now, let me let you think about a couple of those problems for a second. What comes to your mind first? Every problem that we face as a congregation, as I'm standing before you, would be solved if we would just be the church. That's what's wrong with the church today. I'm not talking about this congregation. In general, throughout the country, throughout the we are doing, we are busy doing everything else but being the church. It would be solved. And the Lord added to the church daily as much as would be saved. I want us to see that there's no interruption. There's no compartmentalization. There is no dichotomy between fellowship with Christ, fellowship with each other, and witness to the world. It flows seamlessly. As soon as we have fellowship with Christ, in that moment, everyone who has fellowship with Christ has fellowship with each other. And in that moment, that fellowship becomes our number one and primary witness to the world. Before we say a thing to the world, who we are in the world becomes our greatest witness. So John describes it like this through the words of Jesus in John 15, 5. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth, what everybody? Much fruit. For what? For without me, ye can do Nothing. Do you see the connection? Fellowship. He says, I'm the vine. You're the branches. Abide in me. And what's going to be the result? Much fruit. Much fruit. Much fruit. As a promise, the fruit is a promise that comes from abiding. Look at what Jesus says here in 1723. John 1723. He says, he's praying now. He says, Lord, let them be one, I in them, and thou in me, that they may be perfect in one. 
Now this blows my mind. And that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. Do you hear what do you see what I'm highlighting in this text? He's praying for us to be one, but Jesus is saying that if we were one, then the world would know that God sent Jesus and that Jesus is the Savior of the world. Let that sink in for a second. Why is that? It's because there is no fellowship in the world. In the world, everything is driven by self-interest. So even when I act like I'm your friend, even when we have a nice little club and a group and a frat and a sorority and buddies from work or, you know, even just relatives, right? We cool until something messes with what I want. Let me not get what I want. And we're going to see how tight we really are. Everything in the world is driven by self-interest. So when the world is able to see in the world a group of people who are not driven by self-interest, but rather are driven by self-sacrifice, who are laying themselves down for each other, where pride is not supreme and first place is not the priority, but self-abasement and service and oneness and harmony instead of discord, then the world stops and says, what is that? We've never seen anything like that before. It must be because what they say about Jesus is true. He must be the son of God. That's what our oneness does in the world. This is the wrong presentation. <laughs> We're going to move on. You know what? I'm going to go to a text, to a text real quick. Let's go to 1 John. I want to read a couple of verses that are not on the screen that really drives this home. This idea of our fellowship with each other is a result of fellowship with Christ, and it's also the basis of our witness in the world. As a matter of fact, I want us to see that if we don't have fellowship with each other, that we don't have fellowship with Christ, and we have lost our witness to the world. So it doesn't matter how many evangelistic meetings we have. It doesn't matter how many tracts we pass out. It doesn't matter how many Bible studies we hold. If we do not have fellowship with each other, we might as well quit. Because we've lost our witness to the world. Jesus says to the Pharisees who, don't have, um, who do not have fellowship, he says, you travel over land and sea to gain a single convert only to make them Twice the son of hell that you are. In other words, Jesus is saying that when we're really not connected with God, it would be better if we didn't reach out to other people because in the end, we make them worse than what they are before they ever came to know God because we've given them a false picture of what it means to know God. And when they lose their taste for it, it will be harder to reach them then. How many people have we ruined? Because we brought them into mess instead of fellowship. So I want to read a couple of verses where John really brings this home in 1 John 4. We know this one, verse 7 and 8. Chapter 4, verse 7 and 8. Beloved, what? Let us love one another, <laughs> for love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God. Why? For God is love. In this, the love of God was manifested toward us, and that God has sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. In other words, we don't love one another then we do not love or know God. We have not entered into fellowship yet. 
It's a, it's a, it's a sign. It's a canary in the coal mine that a living encounter with Jesus has not taken place. He says it with stronger words in chapter 3. He says in chapter 3, verses 14 and 15, another test of fellowship. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. (laughs) Let me read that again. We know that we have passed. We've come across the line. We've left the realm of death and come into the realm of life because we love the brethren. He who does not love his brother abides in death. Right here, I want to take our excuses off the table. Because he said, oh, I love him. You know, I just can't stand him. (laughs) I love him. There's nothing wrong. I have forgiven him. (laughs) I just keep my distance. (laughs) I love her, but, you know, she tends to be trifling. That's not love. And he explains the love he's talking about is not just words, but it's love that lays oneself down for the sake of the other. It's love that nurtures. It's love that sacrifices oneself. That's the love we're talking about. If we don't have that type of love, John says, we abide. We remain in death. We're not abiding in the, in the vine. We're abiding In death, verse 15, whoever hates his brother is a murderer. Because you have to to kill that person in your mind. To keep up the distance, to keep up the separation, you've got to do violence to that person in your mind. So he says, you're a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. If we don't have fellowship with each other, then we have not experienced fellowship with Christ and we do not have a legitimate or genuine witness to the world. Focus on fellowship. I heard a true story about something that used to happen in Russia during the time of the Soviet Union. They had all of these factories that stockpiled goods. And there was this one factory in in Leningrad that was a lumber factory. But there was a lot of petty thefts going on during that time. People were stealing stuff out of these factories. So they posted guards at the factories in order to make sure that people weren't stealing. Well, there was one man, a guard, who was assigned to a factory in his hometown. He knew all the people. And he was standing out one day outside the factory one evening when a neighborhood friend, Petrovic, came out pushing a wheelbarrow. And in his wheelbarrow, he had a whole lot of sand. What do you call it? Sand dust? Sawdust, yeah, thank you. Sawdust and shavings, wood shavings. And he was pushing it, and he stopped, and he said, Peter Vick, he said, stop. He said, he said what, what are you carrying in that wheelbarrow? He says, oh, nothing, nothing, just, just wood shavings and, and sawdust. He said, oh, come on, you know I wasn't born yesterday. Pour it out, man. Pour it out, and sure enough, it was just sawdust and wood shavings. He said, okay, well, go ahead. But when it happened, every night for the next week, (laughs) he got frustrated. But soon his curiosity overcame his frustration. He said, he said, he said, look, man, you tell me what you're smuggling out of here and I'll let you go. I I won't even stop you. I just want to know. The man smiled back at him. He said, wheelbarrows, my friend. (laughs) Wheelbarrows. 
Beloved, <laughs> what are we focusing on? Satan's plan is to make us focus on everything else, even every other good thing. If he could take our eyes off of Jesus and what it really means to have life and fellowship in him. He fools us every single time. What is our focus today? Going back to the screen now. That's our critical question. What is our focus? I would like to suggest that we tend to focus on external things. So, for instance, personally with ourselves, the driving question in our Christian life tends to be, how am I doing? How am I growing? How am I getting better? Where are my habits? How's my performance, right? So we look at how we're performing, how we're obeying, what we're doing, and then that's how we determine where we are and how well we're doing in the Christian life. Am I right? We focus on performance rather than focusing on fellowship. What would happen if instead of being obsessed with how well we have obeyed or performed or kept our habits at bay or overcome the sin in our life, what would happen if we took that energy and focused on non-negotiable time with Jesus. I'm going to stop worrying about how I'm not performing, and I'm going to do everything to get into his presence. I'm going to get into his word. I'm going to pray. I'm going to be yielded to him. I'm going to fellowship with Christ. The word says, by beholding, we become changed. But do we believe it? Or are we more convinced by what we see externally? Not only do we fall into this trap as individuals, but we also do it corporately as a church. We ask the same question. How are we doing? Now, if I, was, I were to ask you that as a church, put our finger on the pulse of how the church is doing, what would you say? Don't answer out loud. <laughs> that's, that's rhetorical, right? But then let me ask you, what are the things that you would be thinking of first to assess how we're doing? I would suggest that it's also behavior-based evaluation based on activity and performance. How much are we doing? And then here's the, here's the one for today, especially in this culture, this social media Facebook culture. How big is our impact? That's what we want to know. How well are we known? How many plates were handed out? How many, how many, how many? Right? How big is our impact? Because that's how we measure how well we're doing. Not how strong is our fellowship with Christ and with each other. So here are some of our metrics. I just have a couple of them. Down here, one is attendance, right? How well are we doing? Well, how many people are coming to church? Oh, I'm by myself on that. <laughs> Forgive me. If more people were coming to church, whether we had deeper fellowship, stronger spirituality or not, there would be something in our human nature that would give us a sense we're doing better. If not, we're doing well because, look, the church is packed. As a matter of fact, when we think about when the church was doing well, that's sometimes the number one thing that we say to show that the church was doing well. You remember when, such and such, and back in the day, we had to put chairs down the aisles. There were so many people. Right? Does that mean that we had strong fellowship? I don't know. But I wanted to ask ourselves that question. Right? Numerical growth. How well is the church 
growing, right? What's our report at the end of the year? How many evangelistic meetings have we had? How many baptisms have we had? How much is the church growing? Because if the church is growing and multiplying, then it must be because we're doing well. What about tithes and offering and finances? People aren't giving. The church is not doing well. People are giving, and the church is doing great. Now, let me ask you, does that mean that any of these things are wrong? No. It just means that none of these things is the focus. None of these things are in and of themselves genuine markers of health, spiritual health. There are churches in this country that are full of people, so full of people, they need megaplexes and super domes to fill the people in. Right? They're overflowing with money. They have so much money that the pastors are flying on jets. And every week, they're listening to lies come from the pulpit. They're being deceived. They're being sent straight to hell without realizing that their salvation is at stake. They think all the while, feel good all the while, that everything is okay. So those things are not in and of themselves genuine indicators of spiritual health. Not our metrics, not our external metrics. Outreach initiatives, I add that. But this is what Jesus says. Abide in me. <laughs> and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye, except ye abide in me. Now, let me ask you, as we get ready to close, what is the command? Does Jesus command us to go and bear fruit? Sounds like a trick question, doesn't it? Does Jesus command us to go and bear fruit? What's the command in this text? Abide. Fruit is the promise. Do you hear me today? Everything that we're looking for that's in God's will for us as a church, it comes as an overflow of believing this promise and obeying this command, abide in me. Now think about all the things you'd like to see happen in this congregation. Think about them. As sure as I'm standing here before you, those things do not come by our aggressive efforts to get them done and to set them out as goals to accomplish. They come as an overflow, as fruit of the promise to abide. Remain. And then he says, not just how he, he says, I'm, he says to my father that you bear fruit. But listen to what he says. Fruit that last. Just because you see fruit everywhere, it doesn't mean that that fruit is going to last. It doesn't mean that that fruit is going to go through the fires of the judgment. He says, I'm going to give you fruit that will last into eternity. If only you would trust me <laughs> and abide. Critical question. What would it look like if we were to focus on fellowship? What would a church congregation with this as its central aim and priority look like? What would we be interested in, invested in, doing? What would we be seeking after? What, what, what basket would we be putting our eggs in? Well, I believe that such a church would be focusing first on Jesus. 
Because he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. In other words, access into this fellowship only comes by faith and repentance towards Christ. So Christ, as the way to the Father, becomes the number one focus of the congregation. The entire congregation, men, women, boys, girls, seniors, young people, children, everyone is focused on Jesus Christ. He's our answer. He's our solution. He's our way. He's the only means. So we seek him. Are we seeking Jesus alone? Or are we seeking Jesus plus our programs? Jesus plus our initiative. Yes, 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 we need Jesus. But we also have to do something practical. Did Jesus say that? Did he say, abide in me, then do something practical? <laughs> and you'll get much more. No, he said, abide in me. We'd focus on Jesus. What does it mean to focus on Jesus? Focus is on, focusing on Jesus means, I'm going to put these up together, it means that we're going to focus on the only two things that Christ has left his church as his presence in our midst. One is his word. He says in John 17, 17, sanctify them by thy truth. Thy word is truth. Make them holy. Set them apart from the world. Put a barrier around them to enclose them in this oneness and fellowship by your word. The word of God is what's going to separate us from the world and make us the community of faith that Christ has called us to be. But not just the word, just like something that we, we write and know cognitively. It's the living word. It's the spirit illumined word. It's the written word that points us to the living word. That is what brings Christ into the middle of our congregation. That's what causes us to feed on his life when we depend on his word and his spirit. That's what we focus on. And then finally, actually I have two more. We focus on the body of Christ. We focus on our fellowship and our relationships toward each other. In other words, <laughs> in other words, if we're not getting along, then we need to address that immediately. We can't let another day go by without coming to each other in genuine repentance and forgiveness. Jesus says, if you're, if you're in church worshiping and you remember that you and your brother have some issue, he says, leave your gift at the altar. In other words, stop worshiping because I can't accept your worship. It's not real. Stop worshiping. Go and be reconciled to your brother. And then come back and worship me. So we focus on the body of Christ. Not only breaking down all of those barriers and overcoming the discord that, that the enemy would introduce and offering forgiveness and reconciliation and coming beyond the point of toleration to a point of nurture towards each other and doing whatever is necessary to make that happen. But once that becomes the baseline, then now we fellowship with one another. We're focused on how do we get together and not just get together to have a good time. How do we get together around the word? And in prayer, how do we encourage and strengthen and support one another? How do we help each other carry the load of a hard and heavy life? We focus on the body of Christ, not just ourselves, not just our group, not just our family, but the entire body. That's what it looks like when the church focuses on fellowship. And then we pray, 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 then pray some more. For the spirit of God, we need to pray. For the word of God, for us to really receive it internally, we have to pray. For the body to be built up, for us to have the humility and the oneness that we need, we need to pray. For the Lord to move, for the Lord to show us what it is that he's calling us to do as a church body, to, to meet the needs of our community and to serve the world around us, in order for us to see what his mandate is, we have to pray. 
for his power, we have to pray against the enemy who's doing everything he can to break this down. We've got to pray. We've got to pray. Oh, God, give us a spirit of intercession and supplication. Oh, Lord God, raise up in this place today prayer warriors in the name of Jesus. We need to pray. So, this is my last slide, everybody. So, this is what we need our application. We need to seek Christ personally and corporately in confession and repentance. We need to schedule non-negotiable time for fellowship with the Father and Son by the Spirit. That's all of us. Where is your personal devotional life? Your personal devotional life, or lack thereof, is not only affecting you, it's affecting the entire body. We need to commit to time in Christ's presence. Every day in his word and in prayer. And then walking in obedience and submission to whatever he tells us. We need to make fellowship with Christ and each other a priority in our homes. Do we have fellowship at home? Or is everybody just doing their own thing? Strong families are the first church and make the church stronger. We need to make Bible study and prayer. Let me say that again. We need to make Bible study and prayer the core of church life. Because Bible study and prayer, the word and the spirit, is what causes Christ to be in the midst of us. So every church meeting, every church group, every church gathering should be focused on Bible study or have as its core Bible study and prayer. That's in preaching, teaching, prayer meeting, I should put here Sabbath school, other meetings, small groups, etc. It's the core is Bible study and prayer. Then finally, be intentional about supporting the body. Reaching out to each other, calling each other, visiting each other, opening our homes to one another, supporting the body. That's what it looks like when a church puts fellowship as its focus. And the result the result is that that church will thrive in every single way to the glory of God. Who believes God's word today? Do you believe? If you want to claim this promise today, and it is a promise, because we can say this and believe this and then do something else because that's what we trust in. Right? <laughs> That sounds nice and fuzzy, but we better do this over here. No, if we're going to believe and you want to believe in this, you want our church to stand on this promise of Jesus Christ. If that's you, I just want to invite you to stand today as we pray. Thank you. You have more? <laughs> I'm going to give us a moment to pray silently in our hearts because there may be some fellowship issues there. And here's the key, everybody. The key is humility. <laughs> That's the key. Ask the Lord to humble your heart. Don't make excuses. Don't think about what others have done and what the obstacles are out there. Think about how the Lord could humble your heart. Because if the Lord can humble your heart and humble my heart, then the spirit of God and the power of the resurrection will give, we, give us everything we need to accomplish what God is calling us to do, including reconciliation. So let's pray for humble hearts and let's pray for our church community that we will be able to have fellowship. I'm going to give you just a few seconds to pray silently. Father in heaven, we ask that you
that you would humble us before you, that you would give us grace to trust in your son and to trust in his promise. Lord, open our eyes and show us what it means to abide in you and to be a church that experiences genuine fellowship with you and with each other. Lord, may we not make the mistake of thinking that this is something that we need to go and do. Lord, help us to see that this is something that you will give us as a gift, that you provide for us as soon as we believe in our hearts and confess with our mouths. Lord, take away skepticism. Take away cynicism. Lord, take away pride. Do a work among us. And then, Lord, pour out your spirit and cause streams to flow in the desert to the glory of your name. In Jesus' name, let all of God's children say, Amen. God bless you. you may be seated. Let's all stand together as we sing our closing song. Let the church say amen. Let the church say amen. Let the church say amen. God has spoken. Let the church say amen. Let the church say amen. Let the church say amen. God has spoken. Let the church to come downstairs. As we leave this place today, we ask God to be with us. And may the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you throughout your days. For Christ's sake, amen. 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 Please be seated.